Today on the Johnny Kaberg Show, what will happen to you one minute after you die? Statistics tell us 106 people die every minute. 55,000 people die every day. Four and a half million people die every month. And 56 million people die each year. If you live for 70 years, over your lifetime, close to 4 billion people will have died on Earth. And eventually death will come to you and to me. None of us will escape it. What does the Bible say each of us will experience one minute after we die? My guest today is theologian and best-selling author, Dr. Erwin Lutzer, senior minister of Moody Church in Chicago, Illinois, who's written the book, One Minute After You Die. We invite you to join us for this special edition of The John Ankerberg Show. Welcome to our program. I'm John Ankerberg. Thanks for joining me today. My guest is Dr. Erwin Lutzer, and we're talking about a topic that applies to all of us. What is going to happen to each one of us one minute after we die? What will we see? What will we experience? What does the Bible say? What does Jesus Christ, who came back from the dead, what does He say? And today, my guest is Dr. Erwin Lutzer, the pastor of Moody Church in Chicago, Illinois, and he's written a best-selling book on this topic. And Erwin, I want to start out with a personal story from yourself. Um, all of us, it seems, along the way have come to a point. We're on a train, we're on an airplane, we may be at work, we may be driving home, and all of a sudden a feeling comes over us and you sense, maybe I'm going to die. And you had one of those experiences. Tell us about that experience, and if you had, what did you expect would happen to you? Yes, John, as it happened, my wife and I were coming back from Canada. Our children were in the back seat of the car. She was driving. And suddenly, I found it difficult to breathe. I had to kind of gasp to get my breath. I felt some heaviness on my chest. And I thought, maybe this is it. Maybe I'm going to die here in the car. Now, one of the things that frightened me a little bit is I could understand how traumatic this would be for my family if I were to die there in the car. But actually, as I was thinking about the possibility of imminently dying, the first thing I thought of was not Jesus, though I knew He was going to be there, but angels. Because, you know, the Bible says that when Lazarus died, that is the man in Luke chapter 16 who went to Abraham's bosom, which is really paradise, it says angels carried him into Abraham's bosom. And so I suppose that when we die, indeed, believers will see angels. We can only surmise what unbelievers might discover. There might be demonic spirits carrying them in an entirely different direction. And then, you know, there are some stories that come to us, and although they don't have the same authority as Scripture, they are very interesting. For example, when Nate Saint was martyred, he and four other missionaries died in Ecuador. Uh, they were massacred by those whom they were trying to convert. His son, Steve, wrote a book in which he talked about the fact that later on, those who were there at the killing, when they became Christians, they testified that they actually saw and heard songs that they now recognized having become acquainted with Christian records. In other words, to be clear, the fact is that some of the people who did the massacre actually became believers many years later. And they said they saw beings and they heard music. That was how they described it. Yes, they described it that way. And as they began to think about it, and now we're acquainted with Christian music, they said it was something like that. Well, certainly biblically, it would make sense to think that there were angels there as these people, these missionaries, lost their lives. But the most important thing is Jesus. My mother is in heaven, and uh, she died at the age of 103. My father, by the way, died at the age of 106. But we asked my mother before she died, 
What are you looking forward to the most? Oh, she said, I want to see my husband. But first of all, I want to see Jesus. And I believe that she saw Jesus first because I don't know of anyone who loved Jesus as much as she did. Yeah. All right, let's get down to it. We're talking about what are, what's going to happen from the moment we transfer from life to death to heaven or to hell to Hades here. And uh, let's talk. I want you to start talking about what the Bible says. There are going to be surprisingly some things in our body that are the same. Talk about that. This is very critical because remember we've emphasized in previous programs that when we die there is no break in consciousness. We either go to Hades, which eventually will be cast into hell, or we go directly to paradise or heaven in the presence of Jesus Christ. Most important for everyone listening, when you die, your spirit or your mind goes to one of these places and you are the same person that you were on earth. Now, of course, you exist for a time without your body, and we'll have an opportunity to talk about that, how the soul takes on the characteristics of the body. And, of course, in the presence of Jesus, we'll no longer be subject to sin. But here's what I want people to understand. Personal knowledge continues. You know, earlier in a previous broadcast, we talked about the rich man who died and went to Hades, and he remembered that he had five brothers. In other words, memory was still present to him, and he was remembering what he knew on earth. And not only that, this is surprising, John, but his natural affection continued because what he said is to Abraham, please send Lazarus that he may go preach to my brothers so that they don't come to this same place of torment. He still had affection for his brothers. You know, so often I've had a widow say to me, do you think that my husband remembers me in heaven where he is? And I always smile and I say, dear lady, do you think that your husband is going to know less in heaven than he did on earth? Of course he remembers you. He remembers you with clarity. And not only that, does he continue to love you? Of course he continues to love you. In fact, he continues to love you with a much purer love. And now, John, since we've come that far, I think we should take this a step further. There are some people who think, well, will we recognize our mothers as a mother in heaven? Will we recognize our Father, assuming that He is there in heaven? Won't we all be very different? Won't we be like angels? The answer is no. Jesus did make the statement that in heaven we are not going to be married, but we will be like the angels in heaven. But of course in heaven my mother is going to be known to me as my mother. My father will be known to me as my father. Those kinds of personal relationships will continue. So we can make heaven so different and so metaphysical that people somehow think it's out there, and it is, but we also have to emphasize that much of who we are in this life continues in the life to come. In fact, the knowledge will be enhanced, and you have the illustration from the Mount of Transfiguration where Jesus appears with Elijah, Moses, and you got the disciples, and they all seem to know Moses and Elijah. You know, John, I've thought about this. I don't think in heaven we're going to need name tags. I think we're going to recognize one another. I think intuitively we'll say, oh, this is Abraham, this is Peter, this is John who wrote the book of John. We'll know that and we'll be able to connect with these people and think about it. I'd like to talk with Abraham. I'd like to ask him about his willingness to sacrifice his son, and there are several other questions I'd like to ask him. But here's the good news. I can take as long as I want to spend time with Abraham and David 
and the others that we know about. You know why? Because we have all of eternity. So you can also spend as much time with Him as you want because eternity is very, very long. Yeah. Some people ask the question, Erwin, what about those on the other side? Can they see us and what we're doing? I don't think so. There's no evidence in the Bible that people can look down from heaven and watch us. As a matter of fact, my suspicion is that they have better things to do. But you know, here's something to ponder. At the Moody Church, there was a man whose father died. And um, his daughter, who was about five years old, said this, Daddy, can we pray to Jesus to get a message to Grandpa? Now, as he thought about that, he thought, I've never been asked that before. You know how children are. They ask questions that nobody else thinks of. He thought, you know, there's nothing in my theology that says we can't pray to Jesus to get a message to Grandpa. That's a lot better than the error of thinking we can pray to Grandpa to get a message to Jesus. That's totally unscriptural. We never pray to human beings. There's no evidence in the Bible that we should pray to human beings. But you know, I suppose you can pray to Jesus to get a message to one of your relatives. And if they wonder how you're doing on earth, I would think that they could ask Jesus and Jesus would tell them how you're doing. But I don't think they're watching us. They're busy doing other things. Yeah. We're going to take a break. When we come back, we're going to talk about the all-important question that everybody wants to have answered, and that is, what kind of a body am I going to have if I'm in heaven or if I'm in hell? How is it similar? How is it different from the ones that we have now? And folks, this is absolutely fascinating. This is going to be biblical information. Stick with us. We'll be right back. If you would like to have all four television programs on our new series, What Will Happen to You One Minute After You Die? They are available on DVD for a gift of $49 US. If you live in America or Canada, you may order this series by calling us at 1-800-805-3030. If you live in other countries, you may order these programs at our website at jashow.org. We're back. We're talking about this topic of death and what's going to happen to you one minute after you die. You have to go through the curtain of death all alone. You'll be by yourself. What are you going to experience? What's coming? Is it safe to die? How can you know that it's something to look forward to instead of something to dread? And we're talking with Dr. Erwin Lutzer, the pastor of Moody Church in Chicago, Illinois, who's written a best-selling book on this, What Happens to You One Minute After You Die. And Erwin, right now, I want to get to this thing of when we pass from this life through that circumstance of death. Death takes place, and we make the transition. I want to know what kind of body are we going to have? What does the Bible tell us about the kind of body that we'll have in either place? John, that's a very important question because of the fact that the Bible teaches that we are going to be raised in the future. And if we die and we are fully conscious, either in Hades or in heaven, what are we like? You know, the man in the 16th chapter of the book of Luke that Jesus talked about, who was in Hades, he was able to talk, he was able to feel, he was able to connect. As a matter of fact, he had a speech that he gave to Abraham because he could see him across the way. So how does that happen? So there are those who believe that we have this intermediate body which is then discarded at the final resurrection. Now the problem I have with that is if it is true that we have this intermediate body, why does the New Testament put such a big emphasis on the future resurrection? and what happens to it. So I personally take a different point of view. 
I think that when we die, our soul takes on the characteristics of the body so that it can speak, it can interact, it can see, but our future body is going to be ours at the day of resurrection. This is what we read in Revelation chapter 6. When he broke the fifth seal, I saw underneath the altar the souls of those who had been slain because of the word of God and because of the testimony which they had maintained. And they cried out with a loud voice saying, How long, O Lord, holy and true, wilt thou refrain from judging and avenging our blood on those who dwell on the earth? Now let's not miss the point here. John says, I saw the souls of those who were beneath the altar. Obviously, they did not have their bodies yet. But notice that their souls were able to think, to feel, to speak. And so that's the way I think we will be until the day of resurrection. I also want to go back to the point of how fast this happens, how fast the transition takes place from life to death, to either heaven or Hades, which is temporary hell, basically going into hell. And I want to base this on the verses that we've already gone through. The poor man Lazarus died, was carried away by the angels to Abraham's bosom. And then it says the rich man also died, was buried. And then it says in Hades, he lift up his eyes. It seems to me he closed his eyes in this life. He opened them in the next. And it says, being in torment, and saw Abraham far away, and Lazarus in his bosom, and he cried out, and then he gave his speech, have mercy on me, send Lazarus. Then he said, remember my brothers, send somebody to them. So all of this seems to take place right after you take your last breath here, you're gone, you're either going to be in heaven or you're going to be in Hades. What would you say about that? Oh, I absolutely agree. I think it's instantaneous. You know, D.L. Moody, who is the man who founded the church where I've been the pastor, said, soon you shall read in the newspapers that D.L. Moody has died. Don't believe it, because in that moment I shall be more alive than I have ever been. So I think you're right. We close our eyes in this life, and what people see who may be around us when we die, they see nothing except the spirit leaving the body and we die, but we enter immediately into an entirely different realm. All right, now let's talk about the differences between the body we have now and the one we have there. There are at least four contrasts. One is the Bible says our body is sown, dies a perishable body, but we are raised imperishable. What does that mean? Well, just stop for a moment to think about it. We die and we have a perishable body. You know, today there's a great emphasis on living longer and looking better, and you can do all that. But as C.S. Lewis pointed out, the statistics on death are very impressive. It's about one out of one. And the fact is that we are all deteriorating. We are all in the process of death. So it is a decaying body, basically, but it is raised a glorious body. And uh, what we need to do is to recognize that. You know, this has helped me. When you look at seeds, the seeds of a flower, for example, you can't look at the seed itself and know what that flower is going to look like. Now, of course, we know what the flower is going to look like because people have planted the seeds and they have seen what the flower does look like. But in the very same way that we can't predict, we can't entirely predict what our glorious body is going to be like. But Paul says that our body shall be like unto his glorious body. We can scarcely imagine it for we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. Now, John, very hurriedly, I have to emphasize this. There is continuity between this body and the body that we shall have. And the best example of that, of course, is Jesus Christ. When he was raised from the dead, he had his glorious body, but 
they were able to recognize him by the nail prints. And by the way, the nail prints of Jesus might be the only real memory we have of our sin. So there is continuity. And they recognized him eventually, and he was able to eat with them. But also, it was a glorious body. He could go through uh, doors. He could travel from Galilee to Jerusalem quickly. And that's the kind of body we shall have. Yeah. So, going back, it's a body that dies, that's perishable, but it's raised imperishable. It's going to last forever. It's sown in dishonor. We all know that when yeah. you look at somebody that's dead, that's dishonor. But it's going to be raised in glory. It's going to be sown in weakness, and some of us even feel that now. But it's going to be raised in power. What does that mean? Well, I think that uh, once again, looking at the body of Jesus, obviously after he was raised from the dead, he would never be tired again. He'd be able to travel quickly. I believe that in heaven the thought is going to be the movement. So if we say to ourselves, I want to go from here to there, all that we need to do is to think it and we will be there. And uh, later on we're going to be talking about heaven where the Bible says there is no night. So there is no tiredness and that is a body with power. Imagine Jesus standing on the Mount of Olives and actually being able to go directly into heaven and our body shall be like His. So you can see here that even travel, and it's hard for us to imagine what all that is going to be like, all that now becomes a possibility because indeed it is raised in power. The most important thing people need to hear in this program, Erwin, is how can they know for sure that they're going to be in heaven and not in Hades, which eventually goes into hell? John, indeed, that is the most important question that we could possibly answer. And let me give as an illustration a man that I prayed with. He was a bishop. But he believed that salvation came basically through the sacraments and through his prayers and through his good works. And before he died, he did not have assurance of salvation. And the reason that you can't have assurance if you believe that is you never know whether you have done enough. You know, he was taking the sacraments very frequently because in his theology he thought that, uh, you know, I take the sacrament and then I sin later, I have to take the sacrament again. Here's the good news. Jesus Christ paid it all. There is nothing left for us to do except to receive what He is willing to give us, the gift of eternal life. The Bible says, as many as received Him, to those He gives the authority to become the children of God, even to those who believe on His name. And I speak to many people today, John, many people are watching and listening, wherever they are, if God has worked in their hearts, if they see their need and they see the completeness of what Jesus has done, they can believe on Him right now and be saved. And folks, I would, I would agree wholeheartedly with Irwin, and you need to do that right now. At the end of our program here, in a few seconds, we're going to show you our web address where we have a place where if you would like to pray and accept Jesus Christ as your Savior, you can go there and there's a prayer for you to say with all sincerity. And if you say that prayer, the Lord Jesus, He'll save you, He'll forgive you, and He'll, He'll give you the assurance of your salvation. Now next week we're going to continue on with a very difficult topic and that is the death of infants. And along with it is, we're going to talk to those of you ladies who have had an abortion, who want to know, will you recognize your baby in heaven? Will the baby understand? And we're going to hear from God's Word on this topic and a lot of interesting questions around that. So I hope you'll join us next week. Stay tuned for scenes from next week's program.